You can start, Dr. Hoffman. Okay, wonderful. Um, so first of all, just if Tatiana, you can confirm that you can hear me okay and you can see my slides okay? Yes, everything looks good. Thank you, all right. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, uh, these are a wonderful um, set of conversations really um, connecting us um, you know, with anyone that is interested in the community at large. So I think these are really wonderful opportunities and thank you so much for coming. And I, I really encourage this to be um, just a springboard for further conversation and questions, um, depending on whatever it is, the background that you're coming to this with um, and please utilize the methods of communication that I'm gonna share with you very freely um, in terms of my email um, and, and ways to, to um, contact us as a team. So today we're gonna go over the um, you know, basics of craniofacial disorders as it relates to methods of diagnosis, distinguishing um, relatively normal cosmetic entities from surgical entities and some of the more recent advancements um, that we have made in our institution and in the field at large. Um, so, just by way of introduction, I am one of the pediatric neurosurgeons here at Cornell and um, Columbia. My primary focus of practice is both craniofacial disorders and epilepsy surgery, and I treat primarily children. I do treat some adults that span um, uh, you know, into adulthood in the diagnosis of these types of disorders um, as well. So first of all, I, I'd like to just introduce our entire team, because I think that's one of the most important aspects of um, the way in which we approach patients and children. This is a team. We are here to provide continuity of care of the full spectrum of the diagnoses and disorders that I'm going to discuss this evening. Um, Michelle Buontempo is our nurse practitioner, and she is our point person. Um, so she is the coordinator that really helps to align all aspects of, of care that children with these um, diagnoses require. Um, and we found that that's an incredible resource for children, their families, um, while we as the, the surgeons are not always as readily available to provide that more immediate feedback for families. So that is Michelle Buontempo's contact. Dr. Imahirobo is my plastic surgeon surgery colleague. We perform almost every surgery together. And again, that type of collaboration and partnership and teamwork leads to a really unique um, element in terms of continuity and breadth of care for our patients in that this is all we do always together in honing our skills and approach to children with these disorders. And of course, my, my contact there. Um, beyond that, we have a dedicated plagiocephaly clinic. Um, this is an NP-run clinic that is dedicated um, to providing comprehensive head shape evaluations to children in non-surgical cohorts, um, such as plagiocephaly and metopic ridging. It therefore expedites appointments. It gets patient, patients in usually within a day or two, certainly within a week with a trained provider. Um, we provide referrals for physical therapy, helmet evaluations, and then also additionally um, pulling in myself or another physician if needed need be based on concern for a different diagnosis. Michelle Buontempo is the one that runs that clinic. Um, and then the more complex multidisciplinary craniofacial clinic. So um, this is a very unique aspect of our institution in that um, children that fall outside of the realm of um, the uh, non-surgical disorders, such as plagiocephaly, and fall in the surgical category often have um, the involvement of many additional systems. Um, that need to be addressed simultaneously. And, and, and therefore we've developed this clinic to take the onus off of the family, off of the primary care practitioner to coordinate all of that very complex care and have housed it in one place that meets monthly and therefore allows patients to come to one centralized location and have 10 different subspecialties come to them. Um, and then we therefore can be much more efficient and effective ensuring that decisions about care plans are made in a collaborative way that takes into consideration all aspects that are relevant to that patient's care and then executes them in a very effective and efficient manner as well, not leaving the onus on the parent to make all of these individual um, and sometimes disjointed appointments. So that teamwork we have found has dramatically um, expedited patient surgical and non-surgical care and improved outcomes dramatically. 
The subspecialists that you will find in that clinic range from myself in pediatric neurosurgery to uh, otolaryngology or ENT or maxillofacial surgery, dentistry, ortho orthodontics and prosthodontics, plastic and reconstructive surgery, sleep medicine, speech and language pathology, genetics, social work and child life, as well as OTPT, developmental pediatrics and feeding therapy. So um, it provides a very comprehensive approach for these patients. So to begin first, um, in terms of the uh, diagnoses that we often um, intersect uh, on, it would be plagiocephaly. So this is certainly the most common diagnosis and question um, that I receive from both pediatricians, neurologists, and parents alike. Um, this is described as essentially cranial asymmetry or asymmetry of the head shape, secondary to forces that deform the skull when a patient is lying down. These are a lot of fancy words describing the fact that now the children are put to sleep on their backs, those um, forces of the back of the head cause molding um, while a patient's skull is, um, is uh, softer and, and more amenable to response to the for those forces. So the characteristic morphology of this is that there's an asymmetric flattening of the back of the head, otherwise known as the occiput. There's typically no ridging of the sutures or the openings of the bones elsewhere on the skull. There's no what we call compensation, which I'll review in a moment, meaning there's no um, resultant head shape that indicates that there's a fusion. Um, and then we see over over time that there is typically a, a report from the parent or a pediatrician that there is longitudinal improvement. Uh, the treatment of this is really just behavioral modification, meaning increased tummy time to strengthen the child's core so that they will roll faster, sit up faster, and therefore achieve the milestones that carry them off the back of their head for the majority of the day and night. In the case of torticollis, sometimes we'll recommend physiotherapy so that we can um, accelerate the improvement by getting them off that forced position onto one side of their head. And then very, very rarely, only in severe cases or in uh, the case where a child is either delayed or has other issues going on that may prevent them from achieving the milestones that make this better on its own, will we reach for helmet therapy. This is what this looks like. It is the typical parallelogram, meaning that there is the force exerting pressure on the back of the head. This child probably has a preference to their right side when they're sleeping. It pushes the ear on the ipsilateral side forward and the forehead on the ipsilateral side forward, resulting in this very typical parallelogram shape. Again, not demonstrating any ridging or other evidence of compensation. Um, Physical characteristics are very clear to a trained eye and therefore x-rays and CT or ultrasound are not necessary to make this diagnosis. Um, and therefore we always encourage anyone who is referring or just concerned from a parental standpoint to simply see us first um, quickly in our plagiocephaly clinic if that's the easiest access point um, uh, to limit imaging until referral. The treatment, as we discussed, is that this is an entity that is expected to improve over time. Um, physical therapy when indicated for torticollis and tummy time while awake um, and uh, you know, limiting uh, restrictive carriers on a patient's back or restrictive sleeping devices such as the snooze. So the, you know, the point is that you want children moving around a lot during the day on their bellies so that they can strengthen their core. Our recommendation is 30 minutes consecutively multiple times a day, again, because we're working on that core strength. Um, improvement occurs at variable times and rates for every child. It depends on a child's rate of brain growth, which is going to depend on their constitutional growth. How quickly are they gaining weight overall? That will be the driver for how quickly are they expanding their head circumference, and therefore how quickly can they exert internal forces to remodel their skull. So be quite different for every child, but what we typically advise is that this process is dynamic until at the very least least the age of two, and usually until the age of five. This is a marathon, not a sprint, and we don't expect to start seeing change until six months of age. Helmet therapy, as I mentioned, is seldom necessary. Um, it has not been proven to improve outcome compared to um, you know, normal natural history, physical therapy, and behavior modification. Um, if utilized, it is usually worn for a minimum of three months, usually much longer than that. It must be worn for 23 hours a day to make a difference. Um, if they are prescribed and then worn, for example, only at night, that is not a recommended form of therapy. Um, it will typically require at a minimum one to two adjustments, meaning additional helmets 
during the course of treatment due to rapid head growth at the time that we are prescribing these. Sometimes this can be covered by insurance, but often not with out-of-pocket costs in the thousands of dollars. Again, this is another reason that we really try to limit reaching for this unless this is deemed to be absolutely necessary. So that's the benign entity that does not require surgery and can be diagnosed often just simply by physical diagnosis and behavioral modifications. Um, now moving into the realm of craniosynostosis. So once we move into craniosynostosis, we are discussing an entity that will not get better on its own and absolutely requires surgical modification to protect that child, not only to create a cosmetically um, uh, you know, desirable result, but more importantly, uh, an um, uh, optimized functional outcome and cognitive development. So, Craniosynostosis is described as abnormal head shape that is caused by lack of expansion of the skull perpendicular to an abnormally fused suture. So this image on the left is an image of a normal infant skull just to review the position of the normal sutural openings in the bone. So an infant skull is composed of multiple tectonic plates that are open to allow for both overriding and adjustment during delivery. Um, and so safely passing through the birth canal, but then also then adjusting for brain growth and accommodation of brain growth after delivery. And so there are these um, uh, uh, dynamic sites of bony deposition that remain open in infancy. Um, the anterior fontanelle or the soft spot is seen here where all those openings come together. The midline suture is called the sagittal suture. Um, the suture in the middle of the forehead is the metopic. The two anterior paired sutures are called coronal sutures and the two paired posterior sutures are called the lambdoid sutures. So this is what they look like um, when they are open and normally present. And this image to the right demonstrates the compensation that we see when they are pathologically or prematurely closed. So that premature closure therefore limits the growth of the skull perpendicular to that, that fusion. And therefore the brain is looking for alternate areas to grow and it uses the rest of the open sutures. So this results in very characteristic head shapes. So normal is in the middle. If you look here to the upper right corner, that is a sagittal synostosis. We're missing that midline suture. And therefore the brain is using the coronal and the lambdoid sutures to grow. And so you end up with this elongated boat shape, which is called scaphocephaly with a boss for head, an elongated occiput, and a narrow head overall. If the metopic suture closes too early, you result in trigono or triangular head shape, trigonocephaly, because there's restriction of the frontal bones. They can't grow perpendicular to that metopic suture, but they can use the coronal suture, the lambda suture, so the whole skull grows posteriorly and bosses posteriorly with a triangular head shape. Um, lambdoid synostosis, the least common and the hardest to diagnose. When one lambdoid suture fuses, the ear is pulled back towards it and the skull bosses out um, on the contralateral side in the occipital region. It's typically described as a windswept appearance. And I'll show you examples of all of these in vivo. And um, this is plagiocephaly. And then the other most common being coronal synostosis. So closure of one of the coronal sutures leads to flattening of the forehead, pulling of the ear towards it, and then a contralateral bossing um, of the forehead and the occiput on that side as the brain uses, again, the available space it has to grow. The diagnosis, again, is predominantly physical exam. So this is you know, a diagram of the way in which we approach diagnosis, physical exam representing the majority of this approach. What we're looking for in our physical exam, first you look at the overall cranial morphology. What does the head look like? You look at symmetry or asymmetry. What does the vault of the cranium look like? Is there asymmetry in either the forehead, the back of the head, as we just went through? Then we look at the eyes or the oculi. Is there asymmetry in how they are sitting vertically or horizontally? Then we look at the ears or the auriculi. Is there asymmetry in the way they are pulled forward, backward, upward, down? That gives us a sense as to what forces are abnormally acting um, on this child's skull development. The second aspect of morphology is, is there ridging? So sutures that are fused will be very firmly ridged and you can't move them on physical exam. And then the last is compensation, which we just reviewed in detail, indicating is the skull demonstrating growth pathologically along the available sutures into one of these typical shapes, either an elongated scaphocephalic shape, a triangular shape, or that typical kind of flattened forehead with a heart line. 
We also sometimes use cephalic index to help us with the diagnosis. In no way should it be used in isolation, but it can be helpful. This is when we measure the biparietal diameter divided by the occipital frontal diameter uh, multiplied by 100. That gives you a number that tells you if it falls within the 76 to 83 range, that's relatively normal. When we start to lower that number below 75, then that's scaphocephaly or sagittal synostosis. Above 83, then that's concern for coronal synostosis. So all of these pieces we use together, which are all part of physical exam. If there is still a question of fusion after physical exam, which is rare, in historically plain films used to be used. It is not a useful tool. And it is just added radiation that does not add to the diagnosis. If there's truly a concern over um, diagnosis, then we will reach for a low dose 3D volumetric CT. And I'll show you what all that looks like. So let's look first at this case. This is a one month old uh, male. He presents to clinic just for a weight check. He's full term, born by a vaginal delivery, no complications, but the parents express concern that the head shape has been progressively worsening instead of progressively improving over time. On your exam, you note that the anterior fontanelle is very small for age and there's an extraordinarily dense bony metopic prominent prominence. The eyes are too close together, meaning that they're hypotelluric and the head circumference has been tracking appropriately on the 30th percentile. Mom notes that this pointiness to the forehead was actually present at birth and has been getting worse. So this is what this particular patient looks like. Again, you can note the frontal restriction, the ridging of the topic um, area, and then the resultant trigonocephaly or bossing of the occiput in compensation. So you're noticing all of these things on physical exam. So here's another example that's a little more severe. This is trigonocephaly, again, ridging of the metopic region, restriction of the frontal bones, and compensation in the occipital region. If you were to get an MRI, you would see demonstrated here compression of the frontal lobes. And this is quite different from the child to the right, which has a ridge in the midline, but the eyes are in perfect position, the forehead is not restricted, and there's no compensatory occipital bossing. That child has metopic ridging, no need for imaging, no need for intervention. That is a normal, aggressive deposit position of bone in the midline does not represent a pathologic fusion. So it's really important to distinguish these two. Diagnosis of coronal synostosis. We went over the way that a child compensates. Let's look at what this looks like in vivo. The child on top has a right-sided fusion. You see that the orbital rim or the eye is elevated. The forehead is flattened, demonstrating that limitation of growth perpendicular to the coronal suture. And then you see the compensation on the left side of that child's forehead. The brain is looking for a place to go. So it's using the other coronal side, the coronal suture, to advance the forehead. So you see bulging of the forehead on the other side the orbital rim is actually depressed on the other side in compensation. If you look at this from above, you see, again, there's flattening on the side that's fused. There's bossing on the side that is not. If we look at this on CT, we see this very clear ridging of that coronal suture, closure of that coronal suture on CT, and patency of the remaining. This is yet another example of a right-sided coronal suture on the child to the right. Um, and the treatment for this um, historically, it was only an anterior cranial vault remodeling at age of uh, six to eight months, but now includes endoscopic assisted suturectomy if diagnosed prior to four months. We're going to go over that in more detail in a moment when we, once we get past diagnosis. Um, so sagittal synostosis, this is what this looks like in vivo. This child has a very elongated and narrowed head shape with a very bossed forehead and elongated occiput. Um, if we looked at this on CT, we see a loss of the sagittal suture and a uh, narrowing of the overcalvarial shape. Um, again, the treatment for this does not anymore include surveillance, which historically it did. We now understand very well the potential neurocognitive implications um, of untreated uh, synestosis, and therefore the treatment would be, again, historically a cranial vault remodeling at either six months or older, but now includes endoscopic-assisted suturectomy followed by helmeting if a child is diagnosed at four months or younger. Lastly, lambdoid synostosis, again, the hardest to diagnose because it can look a lot like plagiocephaly in younger children, but here's the difference. Plagiocephaly looks like a parallelogram as we already reviewed. Lambdoid synostosis looks like a trapezoid. So in this image, the right side is what's fused and therefore you see compensatory growth of the brain um, outward uh, involving the forehead and the occiput. So you end up with a trapezoid. So if you look at the child from the top down, you can distinguish the diagnosis. On CT here, you can see this fused right-sided lambdoid suture. It's gone with the patent remaining sagittal and contralateral lambdoid sutures. 
So uh, the treatment approach to synostosis in general is threefold. One is we want to improve the morphology of a child's head, um, eye, and ear growth, right? So we want a better cosmetic outcome, of course. However, the more important is to restore a normal trajectory for brain growth. And most importantly is to allow an environment where there is a normal intracranial pressure. So with respect to morphology, the goal is to remove the fused suture to arrest the process of compensation, and then to allow for correction towards normal dimensions and directions of calvarial growth over time, allowing for improved cosmesis and overall um, uh, visual appearance of the child. With respect to brain growth, the purpose is to allow for normalization of brain growth without resultant um, compression and compensatory abnormal growth. And with respect to ICP, we again wanna allow for normalization of intracranial pressure. So those are the three goals and tenets of treatment. Now in the current day and age, there are two um, standard approaches. Endoscopic suturectomy is absolutely gold standard of treatment within a certain age range and type of patient. So to review the differences between the two, and then we'll look at why we choose one over the other beyond just age. Endoscopic suturectomy is an approach that we can utilize between one and four months of age. So it's something we perform as early as four weeks. The oldest is four months of age. These children need to be placed in a post-operative helmet for approximately six to eight months. It depends on when the surgery is performed, but typically until age one. The um, onus is on the child's brain growth to then um, perform a slow and steady progression towards cosmetic and functional improvement over those six to eight months, because we're not doing any of that work on the table. We're simply removing the abnormal bone on the table during surgery. And then it's allowing that natural history of brain growth to perform that correction, both in calvarial um, morphology, but also in terms of um, allowing enough space and place for brain growth and intracranial pressure. Therefore, this requires a very early diagnosis. Um, it is also typically and historically has been limited to use only in single suture synostosis. Um, however, we are starting to now utilize this technique in some multi-sutural synostosis patients, meaning that in some patients that have more than one suture closed at a time, we are starting to use this upfront to decrease their overall deformity um, and to make the overall outcome of either their cranial vault at a later age more successful um, to decrease the cognitive and developmental impact on their brain growth while we are waiting um, for them to mature enough for an open approach. So it can be used in a stage procedure, in a stage method, or as a definitive therapy, even in multi-sutural synostosis now. Um, of course, this is uh, comes with a, a dramatically decreased procedure time. This takes us about an hour versus about six hours. The hospital stay is one night versus two or three, and the transfusion rate is dramatic lower. There is still a potential for failure of this. Any child that undergoes an endoscopic sutrectomy may very well need um, a larger revision procedure at an older age. However, it's rare, um, but it is, it is not never. Now, looking at the calvarial vault remodelings, known as frontal orbital advancements, this is a procedure we perform typically between 6 and 12 months of age because we're doing all of the work on the table and remodeling that child's skull for them during surgery. There is no helmet therapy needed due to on-table cosmetic correction as well as on-table expansion of intracranial volume. We can address both single suture as well as every form of multi-sutural syndromic synostosis with this approach. Um, there is historically a high transfusion rate. In our hands, this has come down dramatically um, into about the 20% range. Um, there's a longer procedure time. This takes about six hours. We have it down to about four um, in, in simple uh, and straightforward patients. But again, there's a potential for failure even with the open approach. So some of these children will go on to need a revisionary procedure um, at an older age. So let's just look at what these look like a little bit. Um, this is the, uh, these are the models that we use in our hands-on course that uh, we've developed. These are based off of patients' uh, 3D scans of real patients. Um, the incision itself is a bicoronal incision. It takes this zigzag due to its improved healing potential. This is um, designed by Dr. Mahirobo um, in plastic so that when this heals, it is essentially cosmetically silent. You have a hard time finding these incisions. Um, we then have to remodel all the bone that you see colored here. This is a virtual surgical planning for a patient that underwent a frontal orbital advancement. We remove all of the bone that you see and we reposition it in a normal position that allows for normal positioning and room for the orbits, as well as normal positioning and room for the brain. 
Um, and so that's the bone that is moved. Um, this is an example of what this looks like intraoperatively. This is a metopic sutural case um, where you can see the fused suture and the restriction of the frontal bones, which are then removed, remodeled, restoration of not only a normal cosmetic forehead, but also dramatically more room for the frontal lobes and then closed and patients do beautifully. This is a child who underwent a coronal synostosis correction. And this is the early cosmetic outcome. You can still see some mild flattening here, but this is only at a few months of age. By the time this child is two or so, um, that flattening will be gone. Now, endoscopic outcomes are also extremely good. This is an endoscopic child. She had a right-sided coronal synostosis. You see the elevation of the orbit on the right, the depression of the orbit on the left. Here's another picture of her. She underwent her um, strip craniectomy, was put in a helmet, and this was her at age two. It's hard to tell that there's any asymmetry there. So both of these approaches have very good outcomes. So you know, how do we decide between the two? We already discussed the fact that sometimes just the age at which the patient, patient presents makes our decision for us. It's a little difficult at this juncture to make um, a completely accurate assessment between the two for multiple reasons. One is that there's always a learning curve with any evolving technology. Um, endoscopic approaches have been used for now upwards of a decade um, in an R group for almost two decades. Um, and this is one of our most standard approaches. However, depending on the institution, they may have still an evolving comfort level and learning curve with the technology. And so it's hard right now to um, really get a sense of overall outcomes across multiple institutions. Um, there's a lack of standardized metrics in terms of what is a good outcome that is largely based cosmetically and functionally, and we really need to start to standardize those, those metrics and decide as a field what is defined as a good outcome and who needs um, a revision. And then there are just differences in techniques. So different people use um, place their incisions differently. They use different age cutoffs. Some institutions will push to six months for endoscopy where they might have a higher rate of revision, as you can imagine. Some of us do a little bit more lateral bony work with our endoscopic work than others, um, use different delineations for complete suture removal. We use the Sonopet. Um, that's a relatively new advancement for some of our bone removal rights. So all of these differences make it a little bit difficult to very objectively identify um, you know, the, the validity of one um, approach versus the other. And then a really important aspect um, that is evolving now is the evolution of our understanding of neuropsychological outcomes um, with one approach versus the other. So there's a lot of... Um, evolution of the data over the last year, um, predominantly also from Dr. Persing's group, although we have just now opened a clinical trial um, to start looking uh, at the neuropsychological outcomes of our patients as well, because our volume is so high and we have such a wonderful neuropsychology team. Um, in terms of whether it is just the age that impact, the age at intervention that impacts um, a child's uh, neuropsychological outcome following these procedures, um, does it have to do with whether endoscopic or open um, techniques are employed? Is it none of the above? And this is just simply a child's constitution and natural history. So these are very important questions that are starting to come to the forefront and, and that are entering into our philosophy and our approach in terms of which surgical technique we choose. Um, taking that into consideration, let's just look at what endoscopic sutureotomy looks like. Um, it is a minimally invasive alternative that requires early diagnosis. As we discussed, it allows for early intervention. We don't have to use a fully catheter. We don't have to use an A-line. Our procedure time, as I mentioned, is about an hour and a half. Our transfusion rate was 7% at the time of this um, presentation, but we now have it down much below that um, at about 5% or less, and patients stay one night. There's a small access point through which we utilize the endoscope and sometimes our bone removal instruments. This is the Sonopet that we use at this institution. Um, and then it is followed with orthotic helmeting. Um, this is our recent publication of the use of that Sonopet ultrasonic bone aspirator for the removal of bone. Um, the reason that we have developed this technique is that it allows for hemostasis as we remove that bone, meaning that it cauterizes and decreases blood loss. It also is a very small, precise tool that allows us to really um, remove the entirety of the suture very completely in ways that was not previously as possible with typical high-speed drills and rongeurs. And I think that we get a better release that allows for earlier correction in these children and potentially a better long-term outcome. So uh, just briefly, schematically looking at what these surgeries look like in treating 
We topic stenostosis. We place a single incision just behind the hairline so that it's cosmetically never seen. We then use that access point to remove that abnormal strip of bone from the normal anterior fontanelle down to what we call the frontal nasal suture, or the juncture between the frontal and the nasal bones. Um, in terms of what this looks like in real time, um, so there's an incision placed just behind the hairline. Our endoscopic view of the bone is, is small and limited, and then it allows us to then use that access point to remove that bone. That's the use of the sonopep, again, allowing for hemostasis of those bone edges as we're working. This is what this tool looks like as we are working, and that's carried all the way down to the frontonasal junction until we get to that frontonasal suture and complete it. Sagittal stenostosis historically utilized two access points or two incisions. We now utilize a single incision as our access point to remove that abnormal strip of bone in the midline. And again, very similar procedure. Um, unilateral coronal stenostosis, the incision is placed along the fused suture. We remove that abnormal bone. These patients are then placed in orthotic helmets for again, the duration of therapy that we indicated. In terms of determining when a child has completed therapy, um, when they are ready to come out of that helmet, one is just simply looking at uh, comparative to quote unquote normative head shapes for age, what does their 3D imaging tell us in terms of how close are they to that normative head shape and size? Um, so that is one measurement. This is an example of those such diagrams um, on the left. And when a child has started to approximate better those normative shapes and sizes, then we will start to consider removing a child um, from a, a helmet also when they get to a year of age. Um, and also when we start to see that their CI or the cephalic index is remaining stable um, over several visits, we know that additional helmet therapy will not confer any additional benefit. Um, and so those are some of the metrics that we currently use. We're, we're looking to um, lend a little bit more insight and scientific metric to determining um, when children have achieved um, you know, their, their most optimal correction through the use of 3D imaging, um, as well as some preoperative aspects of a patient's presentation, intraoperative aspects of how much bone was able to be removed, and the rate at which they are starting to correct postoperatively. So that's another study that, that we um, are in endeavoring uh, this year as we have now um, obtained our 3D technology. And the last thing I will mention is that we also take um, a very comprehensive look at how to start to better affect patient outcomes, um, parental expectations and experience through molecular analysis of these fused bones. We collaborate with the Ross lab and the Greenblatt lab here um, to analyze in any patient whose parents are interested um, that bone that would simply be discarded um, and look at the potential cellular mechanisms that are responsible for those early fusions to indicate if there's anything that we can learn from the standpoint of um, predicting outcomes, predicting what patients might do better with a certain approach. Again, going back to the discussion of is endoscopy or open approach better? There might be a lot that we can learn from individual patients' genomics and cellular mechanisms that indicate patients that are better suited to an endoscopic approach versus an open approach, starting to learn a little bit better in looking back at um, the patients that we have treated and what their actual bone and blood samples tell us as we then relate what that information, um, how that information relates to their ultimate outcomes, you know, what does that tell us about how to start to be more um, predictive and more targeted in our therapies and therefore helping families um, know what better to expect and also to help gain better outcomes um, in the long run. So that is a study that we have been conducting over the last five years is something that we are starting to gain really wonderful and exciting results from. And I hope that we are able to put that into um, scientific literature in the next couple of years and into practice, hopefully thereafter. So I welcome any questions. I wanted to leave plenty of time for discussion and discourse. That's a lot of the purpose of this um, is just triggering um, questions about either you know, yourselves, patients, um, and, and uh, you know, in, inviting some of that, um, some of that discussion as well as just 
knowing how to access us as a group and, and, and knowing how we can help serve as a resource either for yourselves directly or for your patients, depending on your background. So please, if there are questions at this juncture, if you can type them in, I can try to take them in that format. And Caitlin, I don't know if uh, you can see the chat box. A great talk and great overview. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions. I don't know if you saw them in the chat. Oh, now uh, I see. When, when is the width of the suturectomy that I did answer? Maybe you want to give your own two cents about that. And the second question that's pending is, what is the risk of epidural hematoma with an endoscopic technique? Thank you. Um, so regarding the width of the suturectomy, yeah, you know, in... In standard format, um, typically yes, two centimeters, but we've started to really widen that. We've started to learn that we can take much more bone and get a much more rapid correction um, depending on the age at which the patient presents. So in younger patients, we can be much more aggressive about bone removal, knowing that their um, uh, capacity for um, you know, laying down new blood bone is, is far greater than an older patient. And they're going to fill in any craniectomy that we, that we create. Um, and we, we know that they correct much faster if we give them that, that running board. Um, so that's the first thing. So we're starting to take about two centimeters on either side. So the width of the craniectomy approaching about four centimeters. Um, it depends also on the degree of a child's deformity, um, how much compensation are we dealing with at the outset, and therefore how much upfront um, correction do we need. And so that all lends itself to how aggressive we need to be um, intraoperatively. But again, that, that that's, uh, circles back around to um, you know, where we want to take this in terms of better metrics and better understanding our outcomes. Um, and we're, we're starting to um, become very granular um, about utilizing a patient's initial 3D imaging, um, initial clinical presentation to start guiding our understanding of what that particular patient needs to uh, achieve the best potential cosmetic and functional outcome. So I think that we will be um, within a couple of years really actively folding that into our practice. Um, the risk of epidural hematoma with an endoscopic technique in, 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 in my hands is zero. I've never seen it. Um, it may be hypothetically possible. Um, I've never once had to take a patient back to the OR for any um, untoward effects from an endoscopic. It's a very, very safe procedure. Um, if one is well-trained and uh, adept at the technique, it is, it is extraordinarily safe. Um, hey, and if I can uh, expand on that a moment, uh, maybe you can talk about the mechanism for hemostasis while you're doing this then. Uh, yeah, so, the results so have been so good. Yeah. Right. And that's why I mentioned our use of the Sonopet. You know, that's a tool that has really dramatically improved our ability to decrease our transfusion rates um, in a very unique way um, by, by cauterizing that bone edge as we remove it. Um, so it's a tool that we use almost uniformly now for all of our endoscopic resections and is quite unique. Um, we also use suction cautery um, as we complete the bone work with um, insulated retractors on the dura so that we protect the brain from any potential transmission um, of that heat across those retractors. And we have therefore seen very good results um, in terms of any need for not only um, you know, take backs, but, but, but being even holding the bar higher, um, not wanting to even have to transfuse patients. Right? And that, that's, that's taking it to a little bit of a different level in terms of trying to make sure that we're keeping patients safe, that we're, we're really impacting patients minimally through this procedure by very rarely even having to transfuse them with those two techniques employed. Um, do you treat syndromic stenosis? Yes, very differently. So syndromic stenosis is, you know, um, really um, a talk in and of itself uh, that I'm happy to give um, as a follow-up. You know, we have a lot of opportunity for these. Um, so syndromic stenosis, um, you know, runs the gamut uh, and it typically requires multiple stage procedures from a team of individuals. And that's why I presented our team at the beginning, just to give you a sense as to what we have to offer for these patients and their families. We have an extraordinarily wide and broad team um, that we typically loop patients in at birth, shortly after delivery, or whenever they are referred to us. Michelle is our point person for that and therefore provides a really wonderful continuity for patients. From the neurosurgical standpoint, um, syndromic patients typically require, in some cases, CSF diversion at a very young age. They then typically require 
um, uh, frontal orbital advancement at about six months of age. And then at an older age, they will often require a posterior facet decompression or a distraction procedure. So these patients typically need every level of their cranial and facial morphology addressed. So they typically have not only cranial fusions, but mid-face and jaw fusion, fusion. So the typical presentation is that they have not only restriction in their calvarial growth, but they have that typical mid-face hypoplasia. So they have proptosis of the eyes, retrusion of that upper jaw with resultant malalignment. Um, and so we take it, and I like to think about it very simply in three stages. So we address first if they have um, obstructive hydrocephalus um, that, that is, uh, you know, uh, clearly life-threatening. So that is treated first. Next, when they are old enough for a durable result, which is typically six months of age, we address the fusions of the skull and the upper eye with a frontal orbital advancement. When they get closer to skeletal maturity or school age, six to eight years of age, we perform the mid-face advancement to bring the rest of the mid-face out to meet what we were able to perform at a younger age. When they reach full skeletal maturity, 14, 15 years of age, that jaw is brought forward to complete the appropriate occlusion. So this is a process um, that spans a child's lifetime. Um, we stay with these children throughout that entire process and it's a real relationship and it's a real um, uh, uh, you know, tour de force of teamwork. Um, you know, we, we perform more of those types of procedures than probably anyone in the tri-state area at this, at this point. Um, and, and are happy, of course, to, to, to help field any of those questions and consults at any time. I will absolutely give that separate talk if there is, is, is interest um, and, and you know we can field that after. I hope that answers your question. If it didn't, then please just ask me anything more uh, specific in the chat. Um, let me back up because something else came up here. Um, how can a student get more expertise? Yes. Um, so, Excellent question. There are two wonderful ways. First is our fellowship. Um, so we have uh, our own fellowship. First, um, it has been unaccredited up until now. It is now going to be accredited starting next year. Um, so you can find the application for that fellowship on the ACPNF website, or you can simply reach out to us directly so that we can help direct you to that if you are at that stage of training. Um, how can students get more exposure? We hold an annual practical course every year. Um, we expanded it to a virtual platform last year that I think was very successful and we're gonna maintain because it allowed for far greater access um, uh, and, and involvement. Um, it's a really nice course because we perform, we have a, a, a limited didactics just to orient everybody. And then the real focus is on gaining uh, hands-on practical um, experience in how to perform these techniques, both endoscopic and open. And we included the use of the Sonopet last year. Um, so that is another resource through our institution. Um, so those, at least at our institution, are two wonderful ways to gain a little bit more exposure and experience. Um, does it depend on if they are born preterm? Will it be the, oh, I see, yes. Um, that's a wonderful question. So for the um, preterm babies, we use their corrected age in terms of when to intervene. Now, that being said, younger is really typically better because the younger they are, the more malleable their bones, which means the faster the surgery and the less I need to do to manipulate that bone to get that patient on and off the table. So it decreases the rate of transfusion. It increases the rate of their correction because their bones are more malleable and they're gonna respond more quickly to brain growth. The older a child gets, the more rigid their skull becomes, the harder it is for them to achieve that correction because their brain just can't, can only push so much and can only remodel so much. So the older children are the children that are higher risk for needing a revision surgery, meaning needing a vault anyway, despite having performed an endoscopic procedure. So um, I do adjust the age, but I more commonly take into consideration the child's constitutional um, growth. So if a child is at a really healthy weight um, and they're growing well, you know, I, I will adjust, but I will move forward relatively quickly if they can handle the procedure. And I know I'm not going to need to transfuse them. So I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say in that is don't wait to refer. Right. So if it's a question of, oh, should I hang on to this kiddo for a couple more months before referring? Absolutely not. Um, the earlier that they're in our hands to start making these decisions and help, uh, you know, involve the parents in that decision making, the better. Um, because the earlier that we can intervene, the more successful that outcome for that child. 
Uh, prenatal referrals always. So that's a whole other wonderful topic. I actually do all the prenatal consults for our group for any and all indications. I'm therefore happy to see anything. Most of them, of course, are hydrocephalus or marlomeningoceles. However, with advanced imaging modalities for other reasons, we are actually starting to pick these up prenatally much more frequently. Um, I am very happy um, to take those uh, consults in um, either in office or virtually, which is sometimes more helpful and more convenient for parents. Um, it can sometimes just help to ease their anxiety once they know about it as they move through and allow them to have a really positive delivery experience and just help them process that information so that they're not so anxious. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very happy to help in that process and work with um, you as the pediatrician and the obstetrician. Absolutely. That's, I think it's a really wonderful experience for the, for the parents. Yes, it's a really good question. You know, um, out of state uh, second opinions is, is the question. I believe I have to answer at this point that I, I'm limited to only the states that we are as a, as a department hold licenses. I do know that we are actively trying to work on that so that we can still continue to provide um, uh, virtual visits out of state. But I think at this moment, they are limiting us a bit. Um, that being said, I'm always happy to perform some of these um, interactions by a phone call, you know, whatever provides that point of contact and can alleviate anxiety for the family. Um, so if it's hard for them to get here from out of state, which I fully understand, especially during these junctures and they have a hundred things going on, sometimes even just a phone call um, can be very helpful. So whatever is helpful, I'm happy to work with you. Yep, absolutely. Anything else I didn't touch upon? I know there is a lot, a lot of information as it relates to this. And again, as I indicated, we'll probably, um, based on the fact that there's a lot of interest in some of the spinoffs from this talk, we'll, we'll maybe circle back around on a dedicated syndromic synostosis talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me see. Hold on. There's another. Sorry, my mouse is a little slow. Um, courses held. Yes. So typically it is every November. Um, this year it's being pushed because I, I, we're holding a global symposium in November. So it's going to be in the spring this year. We advertise widely um, and absolutely we can. I know that um, our, our team is on here and we can take note of, of uh, you know, those of you that are asking these questions and maybe include you in our in our uh, email for the invitation for the course. Absolutely. If you want to share with me where you're from, um, if it's an institution, um, you know, we can make sure to, um, to include you. Okay, thank you, Heidi, we will, we will. For Robert and Heidi, where, where are you, um, where are you from? Okay, wonderful, Cleveland, I, I, perfect, okay. So uh, Roseanne, if we can just grab that, so UCSF in Cleveland, yep, we will absolutely include you guys um, in our, in our mailing. Brooklyn, okay, wonderful, fantastic, thank you. You're welcome. Feel free. Yes, please do. Thank you, Alexa. Um, so, oh, absolutely. You know, so the question is, would we welcome nurses for learning aspect to improve care coordination? I, I think it's essential. You know, if you ask me what it was the biggest game changer in, and if you asked our patients, more importantly, what's the biggest game changer in access to care, satisfaction with their care. I think it's been the implementation of a coordinator um, of our nurse practitioner position. Um, it's, you know, it's absolutely essential. She is that, um, that access point and point of continuity. And I think it really requires also, as many of our nurses are that first point of contact, of course, um, and are that forward facing, um, you know, access point for patients, improving education, improving indications for referral, timing of diagnosis, when, you know, we, we and, and not reaching for imaging, et cetera, I would absolutely um, advocate including them in educational forums. Now, along those lines, there is a really wonderful um, APP day in the pediatric section meeting of the AANS CNS. And a very large chunk of that is often um, dedicated to craniofacial disorders. 
um, and education surrounding it. I know that our previous craniofacial coordinator um, actually used to run it, and I'm sure that Michelle is going to start to take on that role um, probably in the upcoming year or two. So that's also a nice resource because it's dedicated for that aspect of learning. Um, so that's another uh, that's another you know resource to encourage anyone's nurses. Um, you know, to take advantage of through their CME um, and, and attend that day of the PEDS section meeting through the, the AANS CNS. So are we using PAs for any of our service lines in craniofacial? So, um, our craniofacial coordinator, Michelle Bontempo, who is an NP, runs her own plagiocephaly clinic in addition to running the multidisciplinary clinic. So she provides primary and independent patient care in this realm. And we actually published our results on this a couple of years ago in terms of how much it aids in the workflow, how much it removes non-surgical patients from the surgical clinics and therefore gives them not only better access to care, but also, um, you know, the length of time that they have with a provider and a practitioner. Um, so it's really wonderful. PAs, uh, you know, it's not that we wouldn't use PAs, it's just that our current coordinator happens to be an NP. So it's not an intentional use of an NP versus a PA, it would absolutely involve PAs um, if they happen to be those that were in our workflow. They just currently aren't. Right now, she just happens to be an NP. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, in California, children's services don't rent. So that's very interesting. So we don't have that issue. Um, and I think that's probably what, uh, yeah, that doesn't dictate our, our decision to use NPs. PAs could, could bill just the same if they're running their own clinics, irrespective of the age or the um, disease entity. So that's an interesting obstacle. Um, but yeah, they have to be able to bill in order to make that workflow worthwhile, of course. Um, so, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a local limitation. Absolutely. But more than happy to discuss, you know, the the model for our multidisciplinary cranial facial clinic. I would say that's just been an unbelievably wonderful resource for our patients. It has accelerated their care um, and has helped us as a team learn and grow and innovate better um, because we're all speaking together. We understand what each is doing respectively. Um, and so that's, you know, um, yes. So, so site visits, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, before COVID, that was something that, you know, I did myself before we, you know, continued to, to expand this clinic, we would absolutely now um, welcome that again, for sure. Um, and I think that would be a wonderful point of collaboration. Yep. It'd be fantastic. We would welcome it for sure. Anyone else from any thread, any question, as simple as, or as complex as it comes? We have a couple more minutes if there's anything else. <laughs> a little off topic, but why is Hospital for Sick Kids such a great place for pediatric neurosurgery fellowships? Um, so I did my fellowship there as well, as did Dr. Swaydan. We both are extraordinarily fond of the institution. You know, I, I think what it comes down to, which is probably the same for most people in all of their subspecialties is mentorship. Um, it's just, and has historically been such a phenomenal institution for the most wonderful mentorship um, that any of us could ask for. Um, and that's certainly, you know, what drew me there. It also happens to have one of the most unique practices in terms of breadth and depth just simply because of the demographics of where it sits. So Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto is essentially the only, um, you know, advanced care institution for children in almost a, a 600 mile radius. And right, so what you're going to see as a fellow, it, it you know, it, you, you get everything innovative by being in the heart of Toronto and having access to mentors that are pushing the field forward as rapidly as anyone else, if not more. 
But then you're also going to see disease entities you just don't see anymore because they come from areas in northern Canada that have zero access to care and therefore have delays in access to their care similar to other, you know, less less um, supported and privileged countries. And so I think that that provides for a very unique training experience and exposure, especially in pediatric neurosurgery, where some of those numbers might be very low. For example, open neural tube defects. You know, that's something we hardly ever see anymore in New York City. Um, it's very hard for individuals to get training in that outside of select few institutions that might see that entity still. Um, you know, it, all walks of brain tumor and oncology that usually would get dispersed amongst different institutions that carry different areas of expertise. At sick kids, they carry all of that area of expertise because they have to, because the next stop over is literally Vancouver. You know, so it's it was it was shocking for me as a as a as a fellow because my transfers used to come from 500 feet away and they would arrive in 20 minutes. And I arrived as a fellow and transfers came from seven hours away and required two modes of transportation. So, you know, I think that there are multiple factors, but it's also just a culture. It's an extraordinarily warm, collegial, creative, curious, and inviting culture. And I think that's something that just, you know, there's a culture in every institution. That institution just happens to have that fingerprint. And I, I loved it. I know Mark had a similar experience. But I hope that's helpful. Uh, wait, we have three more. If you're interested. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Roseanne. Um, volume. Yep. Yep, if you're interested in family. Yep, all right, thank you. All right, if there's nothing else for the moment, you all now have full access. You know how to get me any time of day or night. Um, please reach out for any more information on our courses or our websites or on-site um, experiences or uh, you know visits that we can help with. All right, thanks everyone for attending. Have a wonderful evening. Thank thanks, you, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you.